Gupla Muni Ogata. Stop all right. Hopefully everybody is uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed after our evening at the Star last night with the dinner and Sing Sing. Yeah, everyone seems to be. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to begin by acknowledging that we gather today on Gamora, land of the Gadigal clan on the, of the Eora nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respects to the elders, past and present. I extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, peoples who are here today. So to commence, I guess everybody's heard the presentation yesterday by John Lewins. He gave a really illustrious account of the company and the project and the transition to a uh, tier one mine. And we are all about promoting PNG. PNG, the land of gold on a sea of oil. Well, you know, it's not quite that straightforward, but it's definitely a country well endowed, well blessed with natural resources. So I'm going to discuss today the, the growth and the growth potential in particular, adding resources to Papua New Guinea's very fine mineral inventory. So a port, an important uh, point of John's discussion yesterday is to reiterate that we won, came on to won the Thayer Lindsley Award for the best global discovery in 2021, the Cora North deposit. Alrighty, and you've all seen these slides, so there's not much point in dwelling on it. I think they're all much the same. And as most of you will know, PNG has some of the most, like the super globally significant copper and copper gold deposits in the world. And having spent 18 years now, a little over that now, in PNG, I've had the privilege of working on several of these deposits, and I've even been more fortunate with working alongside many of you here in this crowd and at this conference during this time. So I won't read all of these deposits out name by name. As I say, you're, I'm sure you're intimately familiar with those. But it is uh, important to remind ourselves that we are you know, in the same neck of the woods. Grassberg, the largest individual gold mine in the world, is in the same origin or mountain range that many of Papua New Guinea's assets lie within. So we're definitely at the right address here. And the Konantu region is within the Papua Mobile Fold Belt, which is a uh, foreland thrust. And zooming in on the, uh, the Morabi and Eastern Highlands provinces, this is a, an area of PNG which is particularly endowed in gold. And that's, uh, there's more than 100 million ounces of gold equivalent just within this area alone. With uh, two current mines being the Kainantu mine, of course, and the Hidden Valley mine, operated by Harmony Gold, plus there are multiple large, very large uh, deposits, including Wafi Goldberg, which I've worked on for a number of years, back around 15 years ago, during a very exciting time there. And of course, it also includes the Morabi Goldfields, which have been in operation for a very, very long time, uh, spanning back you know, to the early 1900s, when Bololo Airport was actually the busiest airport in the world during a major gold rush. So nearly all of these deposits are located at the intersections of these transfer structures, north-northeast trending, deep-seated structures that potentially tap the mantle uh, and their intersections with the arc parallel major regional structures. Kainantu itself, or Canine 2, has a very large land package within this area, totaling nearly 850 square kilometres over what is arguably among the most prospective ground in country. And as you can see, the Kainantu mine within ML 150 here, that's uh, situated very well with respect to infrastructure. With the Highlands Highway and Ramu Valley, uh, Gusap, Airstrip and Yonke Hydroelectric Scheme, all very nearby. And the plant, the tailings dam and all the infrastructure are located in the Markham Valley, as John mentioned, in the desert of PNG. Uh, with the port of Ley, a major international port, just 
two hours' drive from the site. And you will have heard yesterday from the CEO, John, uh, the words exploration success, probably more than a couple of times, I think. And part of that success comes from the fact that we are in a very, very good area. And another part, another major contributor, is that we've been able to access new areas that previously had never been explored. So there are a significant number of both uh, porphyry and epithermal targets in the tenement area. They're keyed here. Um, obviously, the Cora and Jard are predominantly located within the ML, within the mining lease. But then there are a number of other deposits in this area, including uh, Blue Lake, which is in EL470 here. And combined, when you look at the, uh, the Cora, Jard and Blue Lake resources, there's actually a total combined 43101 compliance resource base of nearly 18 million ounces. And this is expected to grow substantially in the near term. Obviously, uh, Cora and Judd are the flagship because they're the, the bread and butter for K92 to fund all of this exploration that we're doing and all of the projects as well that John uh, mentioned yesterday. So these particular loads, Cora and Judd, are traceable for nearly three kilometres and they just keep growing or going. Uh, we've had some, or well, we have, routinely very flash-looking ore drives. This is pretty typical of a four-metre-wide uh, face in a development drive, or sorry, ore drive in the mine where you just have massive chalcopyrite, or chalcopyrite for the North Americans in the audience, and also a lot of bornite, just, you know, spanning the entire faces. So it's a really good place to see, you know, A1-class mineral specimens. So a lot of the uh, delineation of these veins has actually been done some time ago, and it's ongoing, I guess, where you have the locals actually working the veins here. So you can see, you know, these are actually some of the best uh, recon, recon guys, really. So we've been focusing, the last couple of years, have been focused largely on Cora and Judd South, which is uh, to the, the south, obviously, of the previous resource. And so... You know, both of these loads have added, the drilling of these loads has added significantly to the recent overall resource update, which we published just last week. And in particular here, you've got very, very wide zones of massive sulphide, mostly uh, chalcopyrite, but again also bornite. Uh, that's uh, pretty typical of these intercepts to the south, very, very wide intervals. So as well as the measured and indicated for K1, uh, the inferred resource for Cora has grown by a massive 58% just with this latest upgrade. And that brings the resource for Cora to 3.9 million ounces at 8.7 grams per tonne, just for Cora. And since the, uh, this is all since the previous resource estimate a couple of years ago. So this comes from the drilling of K1, but also for K2, where you can see the uh, degree of expansion here, and all of it open-ended, but also from the Judd loads. So for Judd, for J1, it's also grown substantially, and for the measurement indicated uh, both and inferred as well, we've expanded the strike length by about 130% for the Judd loads. Uh, so we've, it's been a massive increase from Judd and also a maiden resource for the J2 load. So now, what we're looking at for the Kainantu project is a measured and indicated resource of 2.6 million ounces and an inferred of a whopping 4.5 million ounces. And this, all of the loads are still growing astronomically. So to wrap up on Cora itself, where uh, this long section demonstrates that, that this this project, this resource is growing astronomically as we drill it out to the south and at depth as well. And what is most exciting is that we're closing this gap uh, towards the A1 target, which is a conceptual come actual porphyry target uh, to the south, and that's one we've commenced drilling, just commenced drilling at A1 now. And the same applies, same sort of long section, same applies to Judd, where we've 
uh, you just only have to look at this to see the potential for growth pretty much in all directions. And this will all be accessed from the, the incline, the twi new twin incline, the massive one that uh, John showed photos of yesterday, which will enable a lot of cutties to be constructed and a lot more deep drilling. Now, still on veins, but looking at uh, Arakompa Maniapi, we think we can do it all again with these two prospects because they're within close proximity to Cora and Judd, just a couple of kilometres away from the operating mine at Cora and Judd. And these veins are actually orthogonal, perpendicular to the uh, Cora and Judd loads, but to all intents and purposes, they're very much the same in terms of their mineralisation style and their tenor in terms of their width and grade. At least we believe that anyway from the limited amount of work that's been done on these. So zooming in on each of these, you can see uh, that both have significant strike length, at least uh, one kilometre, and they both have historical resources. So for Aracompa, it's got a, uh, with very significant high-grade intercepts above 15 grams per tonne, uh, there's a historic resource of nearly 800,000 ounces at 9 grams gold, yeah, just gold. And for many RP, it's a shallow resource, very limited drilling, uh, of 560,000 ounces at 2.2 grams. So looking at Aracompa in long section, we see that nearly every hole hit mineralisation and that it was only a limited amount of drilling to depth with, with the deepest hole just around 320 metres. So this vein system is completely open at depth and along strike, and we've got an imminent drill program, which will be to initially target shallow areas, but then extending them to depth. So this will be the first drilling, this imminent drilling will be the first program in 25 plus years. Now, Karempi is another vein system, yet another one very close to Kora and Judd, and also orientated north-south. It's uh, around two kilometres in strike length based on all the mapping that's been done here. And it's open both at the northern and southern extremities. And there's also an opportunity to realise some uh, cross-linking structures in between that have been mapped between Karempi and Kora Judd uh, from that mapping there. So at Karempi, uh, that structural corridor, we've found from the drilling that we've done at least five distinctive loads that can be traced across widely spaced, 100 metre spaced sections. And these loads are likely to increase in tenor uh, with depth as well, as we see at Cora. So it's, Karempi is, in other words, a very highly prospective target, and we're looking to follow up with underground access for future drilling programs there. So now onto K92's porphyry assets briefly, starting with Blue Lake. Uh, back in 2017, we identified Enigot in hydrothermal breaches that had been exposed following localised landslips. So then mapping revealed that we had a, a, a fractured dome complex, all orientated north-north-east. So we embarked on a 200 metre space drill program that managed to test this entire area. And that enabled us to generate a grey shell showing this very clear concentric zoning. Also the zoning, not just metal, with the inner bornite out to chalcopyrite, molybdenite, and then pyrite, but also, of course, the alteration assemblages zone from inner potassium out through inner propolytic and into uh, other assemblages with, of course, a, a quite a substantial lithocap on top. These images uh, show the leapfrog model for lithology alteration and stock work vein density. And as you can see, there's a direct co correlation between the intrusive type and the alteration, the potassium alteration, and degree of stock work veining. Uh, so the mineral resources for Blue Lake are based on 26 diamond holes, totaling 16,500 metres. And we declared a maiden resource last August, or August 2022, uh, for 10.8 million ounces at 0.61 grams gold equivalent. Uh, this was a great hit rate with nearly every hole intersecting mineralisation. So the discovery cost was, was very low, just a uh, dollar per gold equivalent ounce. And... Remarkably, Blue Lake actually represents the fifth largest porphyry, mineralised porphyry, in PNG. So we also flew uh, Airborne Geophysics Mobile MT over the entire area, and that shows a very good correlation between the 
porphyries, and in particular, the mineralised corridor. And A1 is our, our real target. And that's the one I've mentioned before, a lot of enagite at surface. And so we've basically commenced uh, drilling this huge area already. And what we're seeing is that just about all of the holes actually end in very strong hydrothermal alteration. And the, uh, basically it's yeah, down strike, a long strike of Cora and Judd here. And we've drilled quite a few holes, but many to go because we've got a huge halo there to test. Uh, and we've got a whole heap of near mine targets that John showed yesterday. I've mentioned most of them now. But the beauty about this is we've, we've been able to enjoy significant resource expansion from the established infrastructure. And that basically equates to a rapid transition from discovery to mining. And if we look at all these near mine targets with all of the regional targets, there are a lot of deposits and prospects for K92 to, to work on with. As the data comes to hand, we re-rank these targets and try and push them up the pyramid, uh, cognizant of the fact that you need to do prospect turnover as well. Uh, basically, I think it's really important to mention again that you know, a lot of these can be explored and are being explored from underground. So to sign off, I'd like to thank especially our national workforce who we embrace and empower and capacity building, together with safety, of course, receives our greatest focus. So as well as copious on-the-job training that uh, everybody gets on site, we have external trainers and consultants come in on a regular basis. Uh, we recently had Dick Silito here. He came in, uh, and it was a real delight for all of the geologists, of course, to meet him and rub shoulders and learn a lot from, from Dick. And we've also got a PhD, a national uh, geologist starting a PhD at the University of Tasmania, fully sponsored by K92. So on that note, I realise I'm a few seconds over time, so thank you, Drew.